creatively like that at that point for a few years. And uh, when I did, I ended up writing things for kids to read without really calculating that. It's just what, what came out. And in the process of showing Bill one of those, because I knew from a long time ago that, that, that Bill is interested in, in uh, artist books, I had actually gone to talk to him about my other project, which some of you know, which is Can Journal. And I thought, well, I'm going to see Bill Busta. I'll show him this book that I'm working on. So in a previous book that he ended up showing, I, I, I had some loose sheets of paper with some, the beginning of some, some prints, and I showed them to him, and, uh, and credit to Bill for the idea of, of actually putting these in a gallery, uh, which is what happened. But anyway, thank you so much for, for all that and for, for being here. Well, one, of the, one of the things that, you know, as, as I was thinking about talking to you and, and think, and, and also about what an audience might be interested in, and, and of course one of the questions that the public might have about any artist doing anything is why go through an ex such extraordinary trouble to do this. What, what, is it, what, what is it about? I mean, why make a handmade book? You know, we're living in the 21st century. You can just do something on blurb and puff it's there. They print it for you. It shows up, it shows up at your door. Um, and I thought I would just say, start with a few remarks about artist books that, that, is, that is a somewhat tangled web of, of, of ideas that has brought us to the present but just to place your books a little bit in context. And I think that first of all, to say that everything that we, that we think of as a fine art print today uh, pretty much started out as simply as a way to reproduce text and images. It was, it was not intended to be quote unquote fine art. Uh, lithographs first were generally used to do posters and it was a great poster video. Wood, wood cuts, uh, relief cuts, uh, those were books, uh, you know, we, we talk about Gutenberg uh, gets the credit, you know, for, for bookmaking, but what Gutenberg really invented was, which you were become expert in, is movable type. There were books before Gutenberg, except you had to carve all of every single page. Uh, and, and that was very time consuming in each letter, but Gutenberg figured, we can, re we can reuse these letters, we can do that. Um, the artists, so, so one, I have a few examples of some things, just, just because they're fun, we can sort of pass them around a little bit. This isn't really interesting except for, oops, the cover. And this is Cleveland. And this is a, this is a sort of an idea. This was done by the, this book was created, uh, it's, it, actually the cover is about the only thing that's really interesting about it because it's, it's hand printed, some relief print, it's of Cleveland, and it was done by Empire Junior High School in Cleveland in 1922. That, that, that printing was a way, printing was something that was taught in the junior highs and the high schools, because that was one of the jobs. There's a big industry in Cleveland. That was one of the jobs. So just, you can take a look at the inside. The type was, was said, it was, if you look at the quality of the printing, throughout is obviously by children, uh, by, by junior high school students. Uh, this book, uh, again, to just give a context of, of again, a handmade book uh, from a different period of, uh, from the same period of time. This was, with lots of extra pages at the front, is, be gentle with this because it's un the pages are uncut. It's called The Making of a Book. And again, it's with relief prints, and it's with hand set type, and this is from Cleveland, Ohio, Fairmont Junior High School, 1920. So you can see all kinds of all kinds of little things. And this was this was this these were carved and done by junior high school students. So that's again something a little bit of it. But um, I think that if we go on a little bit further, that what happened is that. In the 1950s, there was an artist by the name of Antonio Frasconi, and a great, great relief artist. And he became he he chose to have his principal medium doing books of woodcuts. 
uh, and he generally he had them printed uh, on a letter press or on a, on a, on the, or on a Vander Cook proofing press like, like you're using, uh, in addition to about 500, uh, you know, thinking back in those days, it's, it's, it's kind of, what he found out, he, this, is, this is just the, 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 the problems, it's similar to what Michael encountered in doing and how you solve them. One of the things he discovered is if he wanted to have color images, it was faster to print in one color and then hand color of washes of two or three different colors <laughs> on top of every single image that it was to, to, to print with multiple blocks, mm -hmm. uh, which he, he did that a number of times. But, but so there's that strain of ideas going on. Uh, and one of the things about artist books is, is and I think it's, it's a way to look at Michael's work, is that, um, first of all, in some ways they're not hard to understand, but in another way, it's easier for a five-year-old know five-year-olds know how to look at artist books. They know you look at the pictures. You think of Maurice Sendak's books, where the the words in some ways are almost nonsensical, but the but they carry and they offer a sort of a an images way to carry the carry the the the, the story flows through the images and. Um, but children understand this. They don't know how to read words, but they know how to read the sequencing of images. And that's another thing about, and it answers the big question, uh, at least as far as artists have been doing this, why do you do a book? And one of the reasons that you do a book is that you can't see all the pages at once. And the artist puts them in an order. And you see something, and you turn a page, and then you see something else. It creates a sequence, a series. It's, it's you can you can sort of say, okay, this is a little bit like a movie, uh, but it's also very much like a book. Uh, it's, it's 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 the artist is organizing your experience, and in order to see the next piece, you have to put the first piece, you have to put the first image away, unless you want to come back to it. And it's that it, it's that back and forth. That creates the, that creates the, the, the reader as a participant. Mm -hmm. Now, is that what you thought all along, or what? What made you? What made you? Why? Why were you? So, why were you sort of getting into? Why the book? I mean, that's that's the big question here. Yeah, for me, it, it's it's a book because I came to it as a writer. Like I, I think of them in exactly that way as as a serial unfolding of a story. I certainly start with the words. Uh, in, in, in the case of this book, the words, except for the last stanza or two, were done three years ago or something like that. Um, and, uh, and they were the impetus for the whole thing. And then the pictures, you know, initially, they were just to go with the words. Um, I, I, uh, the first of these books that I made, I never considered, and you can tell by looking at it, that I would make pictures to tell stories. Like I wrote, uh, I, I took some characters that my kids invented, Clamboy, my son invented Clamboy. Uh, Clamboy is like Spider-Man, except that when he shoots from his wrist isn't spider webs, it's clams. <laughs> <laughs> And they swarm all over the bad guys and pinch him until he's subdued, <laughs> or whatever the problem is. And, 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 and Big Sister Kitty, my daughter Grace invented Big Sister Kitty, <laughs> maybe because she was tired of being the little sister. But uh, you know, the, these, these, I just took these two characters from my kids and started telling stories using them, and the stories that they have in common are about picking up litter and making the world a better place. So they go out and in one case they pull one of those blue plastic bags out of a tree. You know, you see those shopping bags get stuck in trees. In another case, uh, they clean up a broken 40 ounce bottle in the street. Anyway, these were the stories that I started with and in order to give those stories to somebody, especially if you're thinking about giving stories to your kids, you don't want to give them a digital file. We're not really a anymore just passing along the oral tradition, like I'm going to teach them to memorize these stories. <laughs> um, didn't want to do photocopies, 
or digital output, I figured the story should be contained in a book. And uh, having a writing and not an art background, um, I just stumbled around looking for a way to do that. And so I came to Linoleum Block. You can buy linoleum blocks at Pakatans. I figured out that I could print out words from my inkjet printer on wax paper and that the ink wouldn't dry on the wax paper. And so I would put it face down on a piece of linoleum block and swipe it with my thumb and the ink would transfer to the linoleum block in reverse, which is just what you need, and then I could carve the words that I typeset on the computer into the linoleum block. And then, oh, by the way, I needed some pictures, so I started very primitively making pictures for these stories. So the first couple of books I did uh, went that way. and. Uh, uh, and really, everything about this project is sort of informed by the fact that I came to it as a writer. Even with those first ones, having decided that I was going to make a book, you know, if you have a book, there's a bunch of them. Like, you can go to the store and buy one. So, I decided from the beginning to do editions of a hundred. Uh, so, even with those first couple of books, there are a hundred copies of Clan Boy and Big Sister Kitty, Liberate the Tree, and so on. And, um, they all unfold sort of one phrase or one stanza at a time, and you see a new scene each time. And uh, uh, the other thing in my mind that's sort of implicit about uh, the idea of the book and the addition of a book is the idea of shared experience. Um, you know, I don't kid myself that thousands of people across the country will have had the same experience or meet each other at a book club or something like that. But uh, when there's a hundred of something, other people can know the story. Uh, and and uh, that's something that I value, just the idea of shared experience. You know, you know there's, Michael, there, it's, it's very interesting the number you picked of a hundred, because, because part of um, the history of artist books has a lot to do with that hundred number. Mm. And that's in the, in the 19... Um, you know, Again, again, you had these people making these, these, these special books like Fresconi, and then there was this other category called Libra d'Artiste, which were like six etchings by, uh, by, uh, by, by Picasso and a poem by, by Yeats or something, which were going for thousands of dollars. And that was another category of thing was totally. But then a group of artists got together, including Sola Witt, and started a bookstore in New York City called Printed Matter. And the big question, that, which still exists, and is still a bookstore of artists' books, and the big question that they had to ask was, how do we differentiate between, you know, things that are basically handmade and uh, things, things that are meant for a, the type of distribution that you meant? So they made a rule that they wouldn't carry any book that had a print run of less than a hundred. Uh -huh. So, so there's all these artists, frankly, whether or not there were a hundred ever printed, but in the colophon, it always it always states an edition of a hundred, so they could submit it to printed matter and hopefully get into the bookstore. <laughs> we actually stopped in printed matter earlier this summer. I hadn't been there previously, but uh, took the family trip to New York and, and, and stopped at printed matter, which was interesting. Um, in talking about the evolution of, of these, and, and, and I'm particularly stricken that those, uh, those books that Bill brought were produced in schools, um, a lot of about what these books are is sort of made possible by the obsolescence of those machines, uh, the commercial obsolescence, really. Um, you know, I print these on a proofing press, which prints one color at a time. And uh, I will wager that any of those books that Bill brought you, uh, the pictures are printed in one color. Um, it would not really have made sense when those were presses for commercial reproduction to, uh, at least I don't think, to um, line up ten colors to make one picture. Because that means you'd have to put that piece of paper through the press ten times. Each of those ten separate blocks has to be aligned with each of the other blocks so that all the pieces fit together like a puzzle. 
it's just so you know labor intensive that no sensible person in a in a printing factory, let's call it, you know, would have, would have done that. Would have been incredibly uh, expensive and time consuming and, and you know maybe bewildering to people who were running those machines at that time. Um, however. Since all those junior high print shops closed, and, uh, and high school and college print shops, and commercial print shops too, uh, all these old machines became available, and a lot of them were donated uh, to places like Zygo Press, which is one of the places where I print, and uh, the Morgan Conservatory, which is another where I finished this project. And uh, they've fallen into the hands of artists who can take their time and conceive things uh, specifically for those machines and the amount of access that they have to them. And you can be ambitious, you know, clearly. Um, and so, these were conceived that way, knowing that I can take complete control of the process and uh, take my time with it and do unreasonable <clears throat> amounts of color registration and, uh, you know, do something like this. Uh, the colophon in this book points out that there are a total of uh, 109 woodblocks in this book. Uh, and in addition, and additionally, 30-some, uh, I don't remember the exact number, 33 or 35, uh, other blocks, which are, some of them are, are metal plates, some of them are uh, made with brass tool, which is uh, just lines. Brass tool is what they used to use to make lines in, in, in printing with movable type. And so I used that, for example, to make the rain uh, with my dad's help. There's a picture in the corner there uh, where, uh, where our boy Jacob puts his penny on the rail in the rain. Um, and uh, I made the rain using brass tool, which are just the lines, but I set them in a block with my dad's help. He happens to have a great bandsaw which uh, he used to cut parallel slots in a piece of uh, masonite, which was the base, and so I fitted different lengths of brass tool. Anyway, putting together blocks like that, there are 130-some total in this, in this book that are all lined up to make the 20 pictures, which is why it takes years. <laughs> That's right. And, and, you know, did you do a lot of drawing to do? as a basis for this, Michael? Um, or, you know, do you do drawing, have you been doing drawing all along, or did it, this sort of thing, you know, sort of engage as you started thinking about books? It really began as I started thinking about books, and even at this point, um, there's not really drawings that exist apart from the finished pictures. Um, I don't draw anything like the finished image uh, before it exists. I start with a piece of wood that I'm going to carve and roughly draw the layout of what it's going to be, sometimes in a more precise or detailed way, but always uh, uh, without developed details. Um, and, and start carving from there. And as I go, I'm deciding what else there's going to be sometimes in the picture, uh, or what is going to be one color or, or another. So they evolve, and people use the word painterly to describe how an artist, I, I think it's, this is what people mean when they say that, they mean that the work evolves as you apply paint, and you edit it through your use of the material as you continue to apply to think about it as you go. If there's a painterly approach to woodblock printing, this is sort of it. Um, I start with this loose thing and then just gradually add to it. Uh, and, and, you know, the result is that they don't, they're not done until they're done. There's, there's no... Uh, do you do proofs along the way? Do you, do you sort of like, like work on it a little bit and then take a print it, take a look at it, decide what it what, what it needs next or I do that. Or do you, you do a lot of drawing of the whole thing beforehand or I do the whole composition, so the structure of it, the relationship of 
of the major components in a picture in rough outline. And then uh, I'll carve that and proof it, I guess, commonly. And then uh, continue from there once I've seen that. Um, it, you know, one of the, it, it's really surprising to me about this body of work because it's, um, it's not something you would expect to find with somebody who hadn't been working on this for years. Actually, you haven't been working on it for years and years. You've gotten, gotten, gotten a few books out of it. But, but the, you know, the, the, design is very, the design is very sophisticated. Did you look to other sources for inspiration to do this? Or how did... I, I, I really, I just depended on, on uh, my own, you know, sort of visual sense and work from compositional values. Some photographs a little bit. Some of these are starting from photographs to set up what are the, the positions of the major pieces. Mm -hmm. um, notably, the Cleveland skyline from the west bank of the flats there with a with a uh, gondola. Mm -hmm. Um, started from a photo, but a lot about that is not in the photo. Um, there's an image of Lorraine Avenue of Denison looking east toward downtown, which has a flat iron shaped building, a modest flat iron shaped building that West Siders will recognize. Uh, that started from a photo. Um, a couple, but not all, of the close ups of hands um, began with photos. Uh, to give myself a sense of proportion, the, you know, determining the distance between where the hand was and, and where the tracks were so that I knew about those sizes, you know, with relationship to each other. But sort of as a rough guideline. Um, you know, the other thing that's, as, as, as I've gone about these, that's evolved quite a bit is, um, just by getting more intrigued by the process and what's possible and how the materials behave. Mm -hmm. um, and, and sort of seeing what I could do by trying it. Uh, with these first ones, it was an accomplishment, not these, but 10 years ago, the first of these books that I made, it was an accomplishment for me to simply have ink on the paper and, 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 uh, and have two blocks line up. Like those were, Three colors, the whole book was three colors, the same three colors. And uh, uh, and not detailed, I mean, that, that was what, where I was, you know. Having done that, uh, the second set that I did, oh, and those were essentially two pictures, one page at a time also. The second set that I did, I figured, geez, that took forever. Uh, I, I should... Uh, I should gang up the images and do a lot of them at once. So the second of those books I laid out, I laid the whole thing out on one sheet of paper, one side and the other side. So it was 36 pages laid out on a sheet of paper about like this. There were four inch square pages. And uh, carved the whole thing. It was again a three color project. So I had for two sides of one sheet a total of six blocks for that whole book. And, uh, and printed them all at once. So one color, one side, and, and, and half of the pages in the book were printed in that color. And uh, that was, um, you know, I, I learned a little bit more about registration and, and what was possible at that point. And in the midst of that, I met uh, my friend Claudio Orso Chacon. Uh, many of you know my friend Claudio. Um, Claudio is a great woodblock printer. and. Uh, he and I were enrolled in the same letterpress class with Wendy Partridge, who some of you also know. And Wendy showed us how to use the Van der Cook Press. And uh, I was pretty hooked at that point because, of course, movable type. <laughs> <laughs> but the other great thing that I got out of that class was from Claudio, who told me that linoleum block, which is what I've been using, has no soul. <laughs> <laughs> And of course, what he meant is that it wasn't a living thing. <laughs> However, he corrected himself. He actually said this. You know, you could say that linoleum block is made of wood dust and linseed oil, so at one time the wood dust was alive. <laughs> and so in that sense, it has a soul. Claudio actually told me that. 
But it's not like Woodblock in that it has a personality. So, <laughs> so with Woodblock, I mean, for Claudio, he says that Woodblock printing is all negotiated. And what he means by that is, is that you have to deal with the grain. And the grain makes a personality and it works with you and against you. You have to deal with the grain when you make a print. And uh, so he told me that, uh, that Woodblock was more soulful and he gave me a handful of uh, what's called Sheena plywood, which is a, a very clear, straight-grained, uh, pretty soft uh, Japanese wood. Uh, he gave me a handful of those blocks and said, here, try this. And so, um, uh, in that class, the first one of those blocks that I made ended up being an image of a goldfish that was in a previous uh, book that, that I showed at Bill's gallery. Um, and one of the things that I liked about the grain was not just that it impacts how you, it affects how you carve and ultimately the shape of the prints, but it also, um, Prints the grain itself. Uh, prints you can see it in the ink after you after you applied pressure. And so, um, you know, that was one of the discoveries. That I mean, it's not a discovery for anybody else but me. But uh, you know, being a person who learns by doing, I, I discovered the, that in that process. And 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 for me, as I've gone forward with this, just gradually adding. Things that I've learned like that to these prints is uh, is what I've been doing. Now you, you said that you, you you started out with the text. When you wrote the text, were you thinking about a book? Absolutely. And so that was that was. And I know in in the previous book, Common Household Rhymes, a lot of a lot of the rhymes maybe two pages went together, and then there was one extended. This more more extended story of a sort of about bicycles that, that went a little bit further, but it was it was it was not it was not an ongoing narrative. But you conceived of this as one piece. Yeah. And 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 then with that text, I, I want I want to talk about you know the content a little bit. Um, the one of the things I noticed about all the images is that they're not from the is that they're clearly from the perspective from a bicycle or from a pedestrian. Mm -hmm. They're not from the perspective of an automobile. They're, we're, we're, not, we're seeing, we're, I mean, it's, it's, it's subtle, but it's very, very, very specific, I think. Mm -hmm. That it's a different way, it's a different way of seeing, and it's a different way of responding to, and, and part of the difference, of course, with the bicycle, is that in, in, as a pedestrian, we're usually on the sidewalk, and the bicycle, you're on the street. So it's, it's almost a very specific bicycle point of view. Were you thinking about that? Or? Um, I guess I have to say that sort of evolves naturally. Um, when, I, when I have begun these, and I, and I should say looking at, at, at common household rhymes, um, uh, I guess I just wrote some of, those were all individual poems, as you said. And the first few of them, you know, came about really before I had thought that this should be all collected as a book. And I think that they were written while I was still working on some of those previous things. And so, uh, it was when I had a couple of those done that, uh, that I decided that this is going to be compiled all together. And, um, and actually, one of them that is in this book, the one about the nickel, uh, he put a nickel on the track and when he came back it was silver, smeared, oblong, a shiny puddle of tears. I have five cents hammers. A mutual friend, uh, David, uh, whose wife, who, and his, his wife at the time, Mary Ann, uh, uh, I wrote that when, when David was still alive and, and, and it, I gave that to them as a gift. It would have been like 1995 or 6. Uh, and then that just was in the past, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. And then as I proceeded making these, um, I compiled that one, uh, that, that first book that you were talking about, Common Household Rhymes, uh, from, from individual you know, stories or individual rhymes. And then when I decided to do this one, it was because I had remembered that rhyme about the nickel and thought, well, this is a great skeleton of an idea. 
if I develop that with, uh, you know, through all the money, all the coin values, it could sort of build as you go from a penny to a nickel to a dime to a half dollar to putting, you know, a silver dollar on railroad tracks. And as you get up in value, that the kid could think about what he's doing and what is the risk or what is he losing, what is he spending, what does it mean to uh, waste a dollar or to spend a dollar in that way. Have you made another thing or have you just wrecked a dollar when you put a dollar on the track? And so it sort of builds, uh, I guess, suspense and he certainly thinks about it and has a moment where he's questioning what he does as he gets to the point where he's maybe going to put a silver dollar on railroad tracks. Um, and then in the end he just decides he's going to go through with it and he does that too and it's over. Um, in any case, that whole thing began with something 15, 18 years ago that uh, sat by itself for a while and um, and starting with that, I just conceived that I would build this whole thing and, uh, and then it would become uh, a book like this. It feels like an odyssey. You know, it's a, that's a, that sort of adventure that crisscrosses the city. Mm -hmm. That um, and it's in, in, in a way, it's a it's a little it's a little bit of a love note to Cleveland. There is that. Uh, yeah, I like the arc, and that was definitely a change from the first one. The the, the earlier book, Common Household Rhymes, is this collection of individual stories, and they're about cats and mice. It's a very domestic and nice, and not ironic. They're just nice. Uh, this particular, this, this new book, um, I wanted to have an arc. I wanted to have something happen and have them all more connected. And as it went on, it became more of a love letter to Cleveland. Like, it, it initially was just, you know, uh, going to be the skeleton of what it is, putting money on tracks. But as I began to draw those pictures, of course I referred to the tracks near my house, which is in Lakewood. And uh, when I made this first picture, the first one actually is, is the boy going out on his bike right over there above Josh and, and Lauren's head. Um, uh, that looks something like my street and a little bit like my house, but it's not really. But it really looks like any street on the west side of Cleveland or Lakewood. Uh, that's sort of the vernacular style. And as I continued with that, um, it occurred to me to build in some specific scenes but then also to include some details that might not be in specific places, um, but that are definitely very specific nods to Cleveland. Um, and those include uh, uh, graffiti details that you see here. Um, some of you know that I've paid attention to graffiti for a long time. Uh, I began doing this in South America in, in the 90s, in the early 90s when I saw uh, really poetry, it wasn't a visual art at all in Ecuador in the 90s, it was people writing political messages and love messages on the wall. And I was captivated by that and I walked all over town and collected it in, in a notebook. Anyway, um, back in Cleveland, what people do on the walls illegally is a completely different thing. Uh, it's visual. And uh, I started paying attention to that when I was working for the Free Times, went out with some guys just to write about them because I was fascinated by what a you know, transgression that criminal act is to paint on somebody else's wall. Uh, in the context of graphic style and real skill, I was just very interested in that, and so I began to write about it. And, uh, and then when it came time to do this book and to connect it to the city, uh, I just decided to deepen the connection to where I live by incorporating some of those images. So anything that you see in these pictures that looks like graffiti, the face on that caboose there, the, uh, the uh, bicycle and, and helicopter and airplane on the boxcars going past that, that, uh, that scene with the streetlight, um, Dale Caruso on this boxcar, uh, the little bird there, maybe people know the sign guy, um, who is a, a graffiti painter around Cleveland. Um, all those are real people, and all those images are real things that they have, uh, have painted around town, and I appropriated them. I told them all. 
<laughs> I didn't steal their criminal acts. <laughs> um, but uh, but uh, yeah, it, it, it really is sort of of the place, um, you know, where we live. I mean, it, it, only a little bit photographic, but absolutely referential uh, all the way through. One of the things about the book is that it, it, that's occurred to me is that that process of as you made the book, you were putting coins on the tracks mm -hmm. to flatten them, mm -hmm. and not as a sort of a reality sort of <laughs> thing. But the fact that you needed flattened coins yeah. for the book, right? And could you talk about that a sure. little bit? Well, I never got to do this when I was a kid. Um, of course, everybody knows about putting money on railroad tracks, and, and a whole lot of people have done it, but I grew up in North Olmsted, and we didn't have railroad tracks, which I didn't miss. <laughs> you know, it just, it just didn't, it wasn't really on my radar. But when I, when I thought of doing this, and living in Lakewood as an adult, uh, I didn't take up putting money on railroad tracks until I was in my 40s. <laughs> Which I have done extensively and learned a lot about, if you want to know the truth. I know that if you put a lot of money on railroad tracks, you can count on about a 75% recovery rate. Um, you know, I've walked along railroad tracks in Lakewood and put 50 pennies, you know, every other railroad tie, and come back the following morning to see what I found. Um, I, uh, I have put every coin, uh, or at least every denomination of coins that we have uh, on railroad tracks and crushed them. And there's some empirical evidence behind this wall in that little, uh, in that vitrine. You'll see some printing blocks if you look over there. And there's some crushed coins that were done over the course of the last few years in Lakewood mostly. Um, but then you also needed them for the blocks. Well, I used the images of them to make the coins that are uh, in the books, including some crushed coins. Uh, I have to say they inform the images in the book more than they are directly made from them. Mm -hmm. So there are coins in these books, some of which are printed and they look very much like uh, intact hand-drawn coins. Uh, and I made those by photocopying coins, blowing them up large, tracing them with a with a a fine marker on onion skin paper so that I could get a pure black image with no shading or subtlety in it, just dense black. Reducing them back down to actual size and then scanned them with Joanne's help and, uh, and sent them off to a, a, a company that will make metal plates from your digital files. <laughs> so in these books, they're not in the prints, there's a couple of them in the prints, but in the book itself there are uh, each coin in each section is, is printed from, from that process. So I have little type high metal plate blocks that make those coins. And then from crushing them on the tracks, looking at how they behave, you know, you don't get just a blank oval when that happens. Sometimes you do, I guess depending on how many times the wheels actually run over the coin before it flips off into the ballast, which happens, of course. Uh, if, if it happens quickly, flips off the tracks, and maybe that coin only got hit by one set of wheels, odds are you could probably still read the word liberty. You know, you can still see the profile of, of whoever that president was. Um, if it gets run over a bunch of times, then maybe it's completely obliterated and you have just this blank oval. <clears throat> but considering that there are some details in these images, like the quarter there, uh, and the half dollar right behind me, there are streaks from, uh, you know, just abrasion or the sort of smeared quality of the silhouette and the, the writing so that maybe it's still legible but it's very distorted and elongated. So I, I, I uh, used actual crushed coins to, to inform what those look like. Uh, they're not actually directly printed from them. I have one more question, and then I'd like to sort of see if the audience has questions. Mm -hmm. But the, my, my last one is, 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 the, is the protagonist in the book a hero? Is he a hero? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> and I would say yes. Uh, and, and, and I'll tell you, this was written except for the last couple of stanzas. Um, 
years ago, but two years ago, let's say. And I was well into making these pictures before I knew how those last couple of stanzas would go. Uh, and I decided along the way, after, what I had to consider was, is he going to crush the dollar or not? <laughs> like he's gone through this whole process. And when you do that, you think, you know, a silver dollar, I mean, it's a buck. Actually, if you go to the store and buy a silver dollar, it's more than a buck. It's, it's, uh, even, if it's even if it's a crappy silver dollar with copper in between the layers, <laughs> it's a few dollars. And if you go out and buy a real silver dollar, it might be 25, which I didn't do. Uh, but, you know, is he going to, is, is, is the result going to be, this is getting expensive, I'm going to be a sensible kid, I'm not going to crush the dollar. This is just too much. Is that going to be the lesson? Or is the lesson and the end going to be, screw it, I'm going through with this. This is an interesting project. This is my life. I'm going to finish it. And, uh, and that discussion went on in my mind, I will say for maybe not years, but more than one. And uh, I decided that he was going to finish it, he was going to crush that coin because of the value of experience. You know, you go out and you live your life and you, you do what you conceive to do and, uh, and, and go through with it. And I guess I think that that's heroic. You know, you, you, uh, you finish the job is, is, is the, the line that he comes to sort of... Uh, uh, unceremoniously. This whole thing kind of marches along in meter and rhyme. Uh, and, and, and in fact, I've done a bunch of this uh, in a sort of Ken Nordine style spoken word with my friend Jamie, uh, who is a spectacular kit player. And I um, uh, haven't given this project up actually, but it just marches along in meter and rhyme. And then uh, Jacob gets distracted by a cat, and it just falls off the meter and rhyme. And then he's thinking about whether he's going to actually go through and, and crush these coins, and it's not in meter. It's, it's in meter, and it fits the structure, but it's not rhymed. Uh, he's sort of, uh, he's knocked on his heels, he's trying to figure out what he's going to do. And in the end, he decides he's just going to do it. It goes back to rhyme, and it just ends like that. And there's not a judgment or any, uh, you know, moral follow-up, you know, in the end. He just goes through and does it, and that's that. So that's, that's how it ends, and sure, Jacob's a hero. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wondered about that. I noticed, I noticed the, the, the rhyme scheme was very particular, mm -hmm. and irregular, mm -hmm. uh, as, as well, that was, was sort of fun. This, does the audience have any questions about this? Well, I have a question about that. Uh, the, uh, the young people who did those prints, the earlier prints, uh -huh. and um, why did they uh, close all the print uh, shops and everything? Is it because of money, or is it because of demographics, or the technology changed? The technology changed. There was no longer there was no longer a need for those skills in the marketplace. Yes. I, I did some of that for in, in junior high school in the 50s, uh -huh. and, and it was very elementary. We didn't do books. Mm -hmm. um, we just did little things like business cards or mm -hmm. something. Right. Um, but it was still going on in the 50s. This was a shaker. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that was, you learned plumbing and electricity and printing. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, Cleveland was, Cleveland was, you know, historically Cleveland was a, a real major center of the printing industry uh, back, in, back into the early part of the century. A lot of Cleveland's, in fact, Cleveland's whole artist community, the basis of it was people who came to Cleveland to work in the printing industry uh, and, who were trained, and who were trained here famously. Uh, William Zorak was trained at Morgan Lithograph by, by uh, <laughs> William Summer. To, 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 to do that. All the movie posters, uh, 
uh, so many of the movie posters of the 30s were printed out as lithographs in Cleveland, but it was a huge, enormous industry in this city uh, that, that's pretty yeah. much gone. It, it sort of follows the arc of the city in a sense. Uh, Cleveland was home to Chandler and Price, which uh, manufactures not the press that I use for these, but it's another press that I use. Uh, it's great for printing business cards, greeting cards, and that sort of thing. Chandler and Press Price has a big flywheel, and it's the one that goes like this. Um, and uh, uh, I'm actually teaching people how to use this as I go press in a, in a starting next weekend, I think. Um, Cleveland was home to Chandler and Price, which, and that press became like the dominant machine, the workhorse machine, in the early 20th century, and those were made uh, not far from Zygo Press on the east side. Um, and as the industrial might of Cleveland uh, came and went, so did that style of printing. And along came, you know, photo offsets and now digital printing, which is what made all those things uh, go obsolete. I would say that one of the reasons that 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 the, 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 the question I started with is why why go through all the work, mm -hmm. and that is that, and one of the reasons is that the the relief prints that are here, the type of appearance, this the sensibility, cannot be achieved in any other way. That 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 it creates a unique type of a unique rich type of image that can't be reproduced digitally, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know. This one of the reasons that I would I always that I like about hand printed books is you can touch them. Sure. And and there's 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 an and, and when you own them, that there's a tactile quality to the page. There's a tactile quality, you know, I just caress the pages, sure. feeling the feeling, feeling the feeling, feeling the ridges. And that's that's very, very much that's very, very much a part of the experience. Yeah, you can you can feel the impression itself, like the shape of, of whatever is being printed, you can feel that. You can feel layers of ink uh, in cases where there's a substantial amount of ink accumulated between different colors. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, you have a question? Yeah, yeah um, I was wondering if you, actually both of you, uh, would talk about uh, your the, the evolution of your sense of composition. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is almost an entirely different artist making these than Big Sister Kitty. <laughs> so maybe you could talk a little bit about how that has evolved the more you've done this. And uh, uh, Bill, because you've shown several of these, yes. what's your impression about um, your sense of how both individually on each frame the compositions moves along? But then, to your point earlier, was there a sense of composition one page to the next as that sequence of the story unfolds? Any sort of continuity or uh, meter or poetic movement from one page to the next? Well, I was telling Grace when we pulled up earlier that uh, I wanted to bring uh, a couple of those earlier books, the Clam Boy and Big Sister Kitty books, just to show people. Uh, partly because these are pretty different. Those. Uh, those earlier, just three color, very primitive books. Um, I don't think I had a compositional sense. I, I, I'll, I'll just say that straight out. <laughs> like they're flat, they're simple line drawings. They're more like color fields, you know. I'm basically I'm, I'm putting ink on the page, uh, block of it here, block of it there, and that was roughly about all there was to it. And and. Uh, uh, it was a significant learning process for me. Um, the next time, I certainly thought about it. Uh, and it would be difficult for me to tell you how. Because I don't have, I don't have an art background. I didn't train as an artist. You know, I have a writing and a liberal arts background. And I've certainly looked at a lot of imagery and art, and I live in the world and look at it all the time, right? Um, you have a sense of what is balance and uh, uh, how things relate to each other proportionally. Um, and I think that part of what you see in the composition is, uh, is the ability to have intention. Like, like, learning enough about it 
to be able to carry out an idea that I had so that there can be composition um, was certainly something that happened. Uh, and and, and the, the other thing that happened in terms of evolution is, um, is that I got to watch how the different materials behaved. And by materials, I mean both the ink and the blocks that I was printing with. And uh, with that earlier book that came after the Clan Boy books, uh, for me, it was a huge discovery that you could overprint one color over another and see through what was behind it. And if you did that in a careful way, you could create different effects. And so what I did with that in Common Household Rhymes was to have light shining out of windows. Um, so it's dark outside, it's a, it's a rhyme about a bicycle ride through the city at night. So there's a cyclist, and it is absolutely the cyclist's perspective riding around town at night. And all the lights are on inside the buildings. And so, uh, in, in many of those cases, they're shining out. And compositionally, well let me say first materially, that gives me the opportunity to put another color there and give it a direction and some movement so that there's a diagonal slash across this picture, which is the compositional element that, to me, just felt like discovery. I'm like, holy cow, I can do this. And so uh, I did that in just a couple of those in that first, uh, in, in Common Household Rhymes. And then, uh, with this one, certainly began to look for more ways to, to use that idea uh, differently. And so there's um, this overprinted glow around the moon, uh, for example, which gives that some depth and, and, a, and a kind of light effect. And the headlight on that train, uh, which projects out, uh, is actually another extension of that kind of idea because there's not just one beam of light that sticks out, but there's two of them. And in order to, you know how when two lights cross over, there's, you can see the overlap of them as they relate together. So that has a, a layer, it's printed in two blocks, two impressions, so that you can see where the beams of light cross each other. Um, those kinds of compositional details just felt like discoveries to me, like, like that I could do that, and that would be a fun thing for me to do. You know, one, one of the irritating things about relief printing is when people are learning to do it, that almost anybody can do one or two good relief prints, pretty decent, on their first or second try, but then they get worse. <laughs> you, know, you, you use up that first idea or that second idea, and then you have to really keep going to, to sort of get it, get it going. But, you know, the, the, the composition on the, I mean, like, like every page you turn, is a great surprise. And it's 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 sort of it's 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 that sort of joy of discovery as you go. And I like I like in part the way that that uh, the text is on the right, so you see the text first, and then act, you know, as your eye tends to travel as you as you turn the page, and then goes and then goes to the image. But um, just the sophistication of the graphic of the graphic design of the composition is something that that I look at and and. and and I think you shouldn't be able to do that. <laughs> you should be able to do that without a lot more training. But I remember back a conversation I had with Durf, uh, the cartoonist, and um, we were talking about, um, there's, there's a sort of famous book called How to Understand Comics. And it's a really great book, it's multiple printings. And it's in the form of a comic book, right? So it's easy to read and it talks about how, uh, it not talks, it, the, the person writes about how how uh, different different techniques and everything are used. So I asked Durf about it, and he said, "Well, yeah, you know, I read the book, and yeah, the, the pretty much everything in it that's true. That's how they're constructed." He said, "Yeah, but nobody who makes comic books thinks that way. <laughs> you know, it's an all you sort of develop this sort of intuitive way. You, you just as you do it, you develop an intuitive way of thinking, and this is an explanation of what you developed intuitively." Yeah. Well, there's a compositional element that's not just within each picture, but as you go serially from one to another through the book. Uh, and, and I would relate it to music. I heard somebody say uh, that a composer's job in music is, once you have the person's attention, to say, no, this way. 
to change the direction of what they expect. So you're listening to a piece of music, and one of the things that keeps it interesting is that while it has your attention and you're following, it gives you a new thing, a new harmony or a new uh, interval that gets your attention and takes you to another place. And um, visually, for me, that plays out in these. One of the things that I've meant to do uh, is to shift these perspectives so that uh, they go from landscapes in this uh, macro perspective on a neighborhood to these close-ups where it's a hand. And sometimes you're looking out at the city, uh, and then sometimes you're looking down at the railroad tracks. Uh, and in, in one or two cases, you have the bird's eye view where, uh, uh, where is it? He's holding up that coin juxtaposed with the moon there. And down in the lower left, he's on his bicycle, his handlebar sticks out into the picture. There's just that handlebar there that lets you know that you are the person, that is your hand, and you're on a bicycle looking you know, down the railroad tracks. That shift from one perspective to another to sort of change the way you're thinking as you go through, uh, I guess is, is my compositional sense in the book, not, in, not individual pictures so much, but as you go through. We'll take one or two more questions, and then let's close up. Yes? It's not really a question, but in, in line with that, I love the, like, the personal nature of it, that you're, you are guiding our brains if you go through in and out and all around. It's very personal because it's a book. It's the most awkward thing to try and display on a wall, a book. Mm. But the, the, it's the whole experience, the story. Okay. Yeah, Lauren? Um, I just want to comment also, I, I, I love these uh, works because they remind me of when I was a kid. Uh, I used to take a little cup and go up to a pond and scoop up some water and look at the little detail, the little animals, the little life swimming in the water. And it's these little small, tiny things that as an adult now I tend to overlook. And uh, I see these as uh, almost thinking like a child, these uh, art pieces, looking at little tiny snippets that as adults we overlook. And then the honesty of the draw, uh, the printing and the, the images is the same way. It's, they're obvious, but like, how could we have overlooked them? Kind of thing. Mm -hmm. well, I think we're going to wrap up now. Um, both, both, both Michael and I will be available and hanging yeah, around. And around. You can yeah. ask, yeah. ask us the questions personally. Come up and talk. Did, did you please, uh, you know. Just, uh, just come up and say hello. Yeah. And, and thank, thank, thank all of you for coming here and yeah. for your interest in the book.